In March of 1972, a young man living in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, took the first step of a fateful journey. Now I start my diary, Arthur Bremer wrote, of my personal plot to kill by pistol either Richard Nixon or George Wallace. From uh, his earliest pretty sad childhood, Arthur Bremer was this pathetic loner, isolated, uh, he had no friends, he grew up, uh, went to Milwaukee uh, primary, secondary school. Uh, was always considered to be, as uh, people said, weird. A weird individual who clearly was probably mentally ill. No one ever noticed me nor took interest in me as an individual with the need to receive and give love. In junior high school, I was an object of pure ridicule for my dress, withdrawal, and asocial manner. Dozens of times I saw individuals laugh and smile more in 10 to 15 minutes than I did in all my life up to then. In his life, I think, a uh, kind of turning point was when he had his first crush on a girlfriend. And uh, at first she was interested, and then when she turned him aside, then he became obsessed with this, with somehow getting her to notice him. And he did all kinds of strange things. In January was when he had long hair, and then he went to extreme, and he shaved it off, and he was shaved completely bald. I mean, he shaved his hair, which was long at one time, until mm -hmm. it was completely bald. He wanted her to notice him, and to uh, he became obsessed with making a name for himself. Life has only been an enemy to me. I will destroy my enemy when I destroy myself, but I want to take part of this country that made me with me. Well, how are you going to make a name for yourself? I mean, this is a part-time busboy, a janitor. Um, he decided to kill somebody. What's a good title for this manuscript? A month in the life of nobody in particular. George Wallace's 1972 run for the presidency began with a Democratic primary in Florida. He quickly locked onto an issue that was dividing the nation the recent Supreme Court decisions affirming the use of busing to desegregate schools. This matter that they've come up with of busing little children to achieve racial balance is the most asinine, atrocious, callous thing I've ever heard of in the United States. And I believe that if I win the Florida primary, that Mr. Nixon himself will step in and stop the busing of school children throughout the United States. And I'll bet you that when he was in Red China, he and Mao Zedong talked more about bussing than anything else, if you want to know. Stand up for America, little man. George Wallace carried every county in the state of Florida. You're saying what the others would say if they have the guts to stand. Listen, rich, listen, poor. Let's put little George inside the White House door. The average citizen has spoken in the state of Florida. They're going to speak throughout the United States. I'm a serious candidate for the presidency on the Democratic ticket in the primaries, and it looks like we're going to Miami with the greatest number of delegates. Thank you very much, ladies. The Florida primary sent him out of there with a dislike on a rocket for the 1972 presidential elections. Less than 48 hours after Wallace's victory, President Nixon addressed the nation. I am sending a special message to the Congress tomorrow. I shall propose legislation that would call an immediate halt to all new busing orders by federal courts, a moratorium on new busing. On March 23rd, George Wallace held a rally in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Arthur Bremer was there. I figured Wallace would be dead or dying now if I wanted it so. After he gave the liberals hell, he stood in the open and waved and smiled. The audience stood, 
Some turned to leave, some to move in for a closer view. I moved in and for the first time saw his face. He looked heavily wrinkled and ugly. That would have been it. I had sort of expected this sort of thing to happen sooner or later, because when you heat up the, the political uh, environment to the extent that Wallace does, you're going to uh, bring a lot of kooks out of the woodwork. He always had told me that he realized he might be shot running for president. He, that was very real to him. And he said, I, I realized that might happen. But he always believed it would be a head injury and that he would die. May 13th, 1972. Arrived at Dearborn Youth Center at 15 after six. The hall was packed. You just can't go around preaching hatred, however you cloak it, uh, however you dress it up, and somehow or another it will not come back to bite you. Two 15-year-old girls had gotten in front of me. Their faces were one inch from the glass that would shatter with a blunt-nosed bullet. They were sure to be blinded and disfigured. I let Wallace go, only to spare those two stupid, innocent, delighted kids. We pounded on the window together at the governor. There'd be other times. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The momentum from Wallace's Florida win had continued to grow. He took a strong second in Wisconsin after only eight days of campaigning. We've come a long way from eight years ago when uh, the Democratic candidate uh, called me something evil because I advocated that which he advocates now. And I think that by the time we get to November, some of the leadership is going to be saying, well, you know, uh, I just didn't understand Wallace. He's really a better fellow than I thought. I really didn't know him so well. <laughs> Next was another strong second in Pennsylvania higher poll numbers, and overflowing crowds. Soon, the press predicted more Wallace victories in upcoming elections. On the morning of May 15th, Wallace departed for his last day of campaigning in the Maryland primary. When we left the governor's mansion that day, my husband had already started talking about he was nervous. He was just extremely nervous. And he just kept saying, I don't think I'm going to go. I just don't think I'm going to make this trip. He said, one more day of campaigning is not going to make any difference. If I haven't won it now, I'll, I can't win it with one day of campaigning. Wallace set aside his concerns and headed north for two final rallies. At the first, a news cameraman focused on a familiar figure, dressed in red, white, and blue. Arthur Bremer, standing close to the stage, asked one of the men guarding Wallace, could you get George to come down and shake hands with me? But Wallace never mixed with the mostly hostile crowd. Instead, he and his entourage pushed on to Laurel, Maryland. I came into the rally late at Laurel, Maryland. George was already speaking, and it was a very calm crowd, very nice, congenial crowd. Everything just seemed really nice. So he came down and he started shaking hands. The Secret Service agent in charge asked Wallace not to go into the crowd. That's all right, Wallace said. I'll take the responsibility. And then all of a sudden I heard, Dot, 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 dot. And then time just stood still. I thought they'd shoot him again. And so I jumped on top of him, trying to cover up his head and his heart and his vital organs, his lungs. And uh, there just wasn't anybody around him. Well, 
The Alabama bodyguard had been shot and blown out, knocked down. The Secret Service agent that was, these two were supposed to protect his body, got shot in the jaw and was vomiting and vomiting blood. So I just kept saying, uh, he, he was dazed and he didn't speak, and I kept saying, George, I'm gonna take you home, I'm gonna take you home, and uh, we're going home now. And uh, finally, all of a sudden, somebody was pulling me away from him. I kept begging him, I said, Let, don't take me away from my husband now. Please don't take me away from my husband now. I was able to get in the ambulance, and they put George in, and the Alabama State Trooper Dothard in on another stretcher. I think I was in a courtroom and somebody came in and said that Wallace had been shot. There were all around Selma that day, folk who disliked George Wallace intensely were praying that he recover. They didn't want him dead. Uh, and they, they, there, there was no rejoicing among black Alabamians that George Wallace had been shot, but there was a lot of the chickens have come home to roost. You heard that everywhere. Wallace, by the mid-1960s, was certainly aware that he was a figure in danger. That is, we'd had the assassination of, of Kennedy, the two Kennedy brothers and Martin Luther King, and he often talked about the danger that he had. But I think he always anticipated the kind of uh, political ideologue, somebody who opposed him, uh, um, finding him at some moment and shooting him. George Wallace, the most intensely ideological political candidate of the 1960s, ends up being shot by somebody who just wants to get his picture on the front page of the New York Times. <laughs> 